Hi, welcome to our presentation today. My name is Dr. Katie LaShawn, and I'm a faculty member here at the University of Notre Dame. Today, I'm joined by my incredible colleague, Dr. Betsy Okello. Hi, I'm Betsy Okello. I am a faculty member in the Mary Ann Rimmick Leadership Program here at the University of Notre Dame. Today, we are so thrilled to be speaking to you about unlocking the reading code for English learners. So we're really going to combine uh, Dr. Okello's expertise in literacy and my expertise in English learners. And we're going to talk about how these two um, really important um, ideas intersect around making all of our children feel like incredibly capable readers and writers, right, Dr. Okello? Yes. We'll talk about Betsy's uh, video series when we get towards the end here. But as we do all things, we would love to begin in prayer. So please join me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, thank you for the opportunity to encounter you and others. Animate my work that I may embrace my students and their families who so beautifully reflect the diverse and universal church. Inspire my efforts to educate the whole child, celebrating the cultures and languages that enrich our school. Bless my efforts to empower children and families to recognize and employ their own unique gifts and talents to renew our community in your image. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So friends here at Notre Dame, um, one thing that we, we believe deeply is that our Catholic schools are enriched and graced by culturally and linguistically diverse children. Because we deeply believe that, um, we are driven to this wonderful mission of cultivating teacher leaders who work to ensure that English learning children are thriving in our Catholic schools. And we believe deeply that our Catholic schools are made better um, by serving our multilingual learners. So through this belief and through this mission, we have lots of outreach uh, that we would love to involve you in. The first one is PD, just like today. Um, we also offer a series of online modules coupled by Zoom calls. We'd love to be in your faculty meetings. We'd also love to invite you to become ENL Hernandez Fellows and get your ESL certification so you too can become a teacher leader and an expert in serving your English learners. But through all of these different touch points, we've really come to realize that we need to unlock the reading code. We need to help teachers better understand how English learners are processing reading, um, what inputs they need, and how we can better support them. So to best support you today, uh, we are teachers at heart. So we have made you a graphic organizer. So as you can see here, we'd love for you to pause and visit this website, ace.nd.edu backslash ENL. And I'm gonna walk you through this. So I'm at this website. When you come down, it's our ENL home site. We'll see four circles here, coursework, professional development, resources, and dual language programs all things we'd love to partner on you with, but I'd love for you to click innovative resources. On this site, there's all kinds of things for you and resources for you to strengthen your instruction. If you come down all the way to the bottom, we have four NCEA presentations um, this year for NCEA. And I'd love for you to click on this webinar called Unlock Reading. And here you can see a graphic organizer that you can follow along with. Um, as we do our presentation today. So that is there for you. So take just a moment, pause, download your materials and rejoin us when you're ready, please. Here's what we're going to do together. We're gonna to do two things. By the end of this presentation, you're gonna be able to put two check marks by these things. We want you to be able to develop a deeper understanding of your English learning students, how to identify them, language proficiency levels and their home language. We also want you to be able to put a big check mark by the idea of identifying the essential elements of literacy instruction to ensure high quality, equitable literacy practices for all learners. We can't wait to get you um, to successfully master these two objectives today. So as we begin, we wanna start with three big ideas. When it comes to second language acquisition, we feel like it's really important to frame several things as you become better come to understand who your English learners are and what their needs are in terms of literacy. So here's your first big idea. As Dr. O'Callaghan and I know well, one English learner is not another English learner is not another English learner. Uh, the home language environments of our students, their biliteracy skills versus their bilingual skills. Um, there are so many nuances to your English learners and we want you to know these students and their stories deeply. 
One way of coming to know this is understanding the language proficiency level of your students. Generally speaking, there are five stages of language acquisition. All of your major language assessments are based on this idea as well. So Lost Links, WIDA, you name it. They all come down to these general stages. The first three stages are what I consider pretty obvious English learners. You're gonna know if your student or your, is in the silent period. These are often called newcomers. These children possess one to 500 words. It may take zero to six months in this first initial stage. Remember though, this doesn't just mean young in terms of age. You can also have a student in the silent period that enters your 11th grade math classroom, right? So it's the process of language acquisition, um, not just age. Early production is our second stage. Six months to a year is about how long a student can be expected to spend in the second stage. And they may know a thousand words. While they might not be able to complete your, your three paragraph essay that you're asking, they can give you one or two word responses or short phrases. WIDA calls these the can-do indicators. There are lots of things here that our students can do in order to show you their content knowledge and their language development, right? So speech emergence, one to three years, these students have about 3,000 words. And if you stop and think, I know Dr. Okello has a really beautiful working vocabulary in Swahili. Dr. Okello, 3,000 words? That's an actually enormous vocabulary, right? Think about the tremendous work that these students are doing to acquire both content and language. They're able to write simple sentences. They still have some errors, right? What I really want you to pay attention here to is this intermediate fluency stage. These children have been in school about three to five years. They have 6,000 words. They can write complex sentences. They're socially fluent. They may have some isolated challenges with grammar, um, often the, we say that this is where English learners get stuck and they get stuck because just years experience will say the content is getting harder, right? We say in the early, early grades that you're learning to read versus reading to learn. So what happens in this intermediate fluency stage is students, the content gets harder. There's a lot more reading and writing involved. And as the middle school social studies teacher, sometimes I start to begin to think that it's not my responsibility to form language. I teach content. Um, while we know that that's not true and that every teacher is a language teacher, um, this is often where we, we start to see students fall into this category of being lifelong English learners, where they just don't quite transition to becoming uh, fluent in grade level English. I want you to take just a second here and pause this video. Take a couple quick notes on um, maybe students you've had in these different stages, um, maybe thinking about how you convey this message to your grade level teams, how your school leadership talks about the language proficiency levels of students, and probably most importantly, how you were planning this year to move a student from early production to speech emergence, for example. How are you moving the needle for your English learners. Rejoin us um, by starting us again whenever you are ready. All right, let's bridge to big idea number two, is that we can't just focus on one domain of learning, which is ironic because this whole presentation is on reading, uh, which is one domain of, of language, I mean. But, um, but we know that when we are acquiring a second language, generally, we're strongest in our ability to listen and understand a different language, right? Uh, an example for by mode of example in Spanish, I am I can understand complete conversations, right? Next comes comes our ability to speak, um, then comes our ability to read, and then comes our ability to write. So to write and to read in a second language, generally speaking, is just harder than it is to listen and to speak. So to read and write tend to be harder domains of language for a couple of reasons. Number one, if Dr. Kello and I are sitting here conversing, I can correct language in the moment. If she's looking confused, I'm gonna try to say it again a different way. I'm gonna use my, my body. I'm gonna maybe even pull in real objects. Oftentimes our reading and writing just tends to be a little bit more devoid of, of negotiation. And it tends to be um, a little bit harder to gain context. These are also the two areas, reading and writing, where our children 
need the most support, but it's also some of the most beautiful areas to expand their world and to engage them in all kinds of different topics. Dr. Ocalo, do you have anything at this point to add about, about reading or about these four domains? I think that the four domains of language are helpful for all students, not just for your English language learners, and that uh, teachers who intentionally build in daily opportunities for listening, speaking, reading, and writing for all of their students um, will ultimately see better outcomes in literacy. Um, so later we'll talk about opportunities for high-level talk and writing about texts, um, and we want to make sure that, that those are daily occurrences in our, in our classrooms and in our schools to support all of our learners. I agree with that completely. And that really strong oracy skills and listening skills can lead to better reading, right? And, and, and vice versa. In reading, we can process what we've learned through listening and speaking. So I agree, absolutely. Here's your last big idea, big idea number three. I want you to remember that your student's home language is an asset. So being multilingual, I love this poster. Being multilingual is my superpower. I need teachers to help me soar. I need teachers in classrooms. I need you in your classroom to understand that reading at home, watching TV at home in another language, writing in another language, rich literacy environments at home in a child's first language result in children um, being able to bridge to literacy in English um, quicker and at a more profound level. So the theory, the, there's a theory, it's research-based. We know that the stronger a child is in their home language, the stronger they're going to be at acquiring a second and third language because so many of the skills of reading transfer, right? So being able to blend, being able to, to know how to turn pages, to know how to comprehend, to know how to string together words. So many of the skills of reading transfer. I, I just bring this up because Dr. Kell, I'm sure you hear this too, but sometimes I hear teachers say, my job would be easier if my students spoke English at home. What would you say to that, Dr. Ocello? I would say the most important aspect is that uh, families are engaging in literacy practices at home together, regardless of the language that they occur in. And so it's beautiful when families can read to their children and do oral storytelling and talk while doing the dishes or while shopping in any language and that those are equally as beneficial as, um, as doing that in English. And so we really wanna be able to support the literacy practices of families in their home languages um, and not uh, see that as a deficit um, because it really enriches the experience and the lives of the students and teachers and the communities that they will enter. And so um, it's always, anytime I uh, talk to teachers about inviting families in to read in school to children, I always say, allow those families to read in whatever language they feel most comfortable in. Even if not all the students speak that language, they will benefit from the rich experience of hearing a second language um, and be just as immersed in the story. Absolutely, 100%. So I want you to pause here for just a moment. And I want you to think about these three ideas of the stages of second language acquisition, of um, the four domains of language, and of home language being an asset. I want you to pause for just a second and think how all of these things work together. What are your places for improvement potentially? And also, how does this relate to the literacy environment in your classroom? Take just a moment when you're ready to resume. We're gonna bridge here. Thank you very much. All right. So Dr. Kello is going to help us dive into so much of, of kind of the fundamentals of reading here. And as we get there, um, I just wanna share a little bit, Dr. Kello, of I was just in a classroom, uh, a couple of classrooms last week doing professional development. And these are some things that I heard teachers say. Um, the first thing is here up at the top that Jose can't read. Um, and I knew what the teacher was trying to say um, it, by making that statement, but I was so curious about, well, tell me more. What are you observing? What are you noticing? Um, and these are some things that, that came up for multilingual learners in a reading setting. Number one, the teacher was saying, sometimes my English learners omit words when they're reading. Sometimes they seem a little bit distracted. 
Sometimes they seem to understand, but they can't retell the events. Sometimes you might hear teachers say I, they can't answer, meaning our English learners have difficulty answering questions after reading. You can also hear teachers say that, that my English learners struggle reading independently, that they spend a significant amount of time trying to read, that they struggle with basic sounds, they're stopping frequently, and they might not seem to grasp the content of the text. So these came from teacher anecdotes. Um, Dr. Kello, I'd love you to give you the moment here to maybe respond to a couple of these statements or in general, can you help me frame this in a way that, that as a teacher, um, that I see this, but I guess I'm trying to ask you maybe a difficult question on the spot too, is like, how do I recognize the strengths in this too, right? So how do I get away from Jose can't read to Jose is learning to read? Um, so I just asked you two questions on the spot. So number one, can you maybe help us think through some of these pieces? Um, and then also, how do we reframe this in a way that is really asset driven? So I do think that identity is a really important part of learning. And so I think the first piece is to always say that we are all readers and we are all writers and that that's a shared community identity that we all have and to be able to refer to your students as readers and as writers and that um, there are students who have current struggles with aspects of reading, um, but it's uh, not helpful to just say that a student can't read because that doesn't help you. It's like going to the doctor and the doctor tells you that you're sick, but doesn't diagnose you and doesn't know what's wrong with you. Um, so rather than saying that our children can't read, it's helpful and essential for literacy teachers to listen to children while they're reading and to be able to notice when are they using a strategy. Um, if they seem like they're lost, ask them the question of how are you trying to make sense of what you're reading? Um, being able to notice what students actually do um, when they're confronted with a difficult text allows us to coach them and to know how to best support them um, in the learning that they're, that they're doing and being able to meet them where they are in their reading journey. So um, all students um, have the ability to read and write at very high levels and they will all get there. Um, and that journey is gonna look a little bit different for every child. And so our job as teachers is to really listen and watch um, while students are reading and writing so that we know how best to intervene to be able to help them uh, read and write at the highest levels um, that they we know that they can reach. I love that. I really love your framing that we are all readers and writers. Um, I think that's something we can all take back to our classroom. And I really love your push here to have me as a teacher really observing and listening. I loved your word listening, that I am listening. Talk about the four domains, right? That I am seeing and I am listening um, to really where my students are at. Thank you, that's absolutely beautiful. So I wanna pose a little bit of a question here to you as, as participants and also to Dr. Okello. Here's my first question, I want you to reflect. In a typical day, how much time are students spending doing activities about reading versus reading an authentic text for an authentic purpose. Dr. Kello, as our expert here, how do you see this playing out in our classrooms? So I often see a, sort of a flurry of activity about reading um, in, in classrooms. So students doing worksheets, um, completing packets, uh, looking up vocabulary words. Um, and some of that has a place, um, but when it's disconnected from the authentic experience of reading and writing with the text, um, it can just feel like a bunch of isolated activities that don't make a lot of sense to the students as they're, as they're completing those tasks. So um, we focus a lot on authenticity, and there are two sides of that, the authentic text and the authentic purpose. So you might have an authentic text, like you might, for example, bring in a newspaper from your community and bring it into your classroom and have students read it. But if the purpose for reading it is only to answer comprehension questions about the newspaper and the stories that are in it, that's not an authentic purpose because that's not something that real readers read a newspaper for. But if they're reading the newspaper to write an article and that would be able to be published in that same newspaper or to write an opinion piece uh, in response to something that they've read, then they're engaging with an authentic text for an authentic purpose. And then all the other aspects of literacy instruction that we know about their ability to, to write well and those grammar skills and the decoding skills they need to read the text can all come together while they're engaged in that, uh, in that authentic uh, activity. 
So there is certainly a place, and we'll get to this, for systematic, explicit, strong instruction in each of the elements of literacy instruction. But those should never be the end in and of themselves. They then have to be applied to authentic reading and writing tasks. I love that. As a teacher, it's making me think um, kind of how much time are my students spending doing activities about reading? Um, I really want to pay attention to that. And then really bringing this up, up this idea of authenticity. Um, that is really helpful framing. Take just a moment to look at your graphic organizer and write down some ideas um, in regard to this reflection question, please. When you're ready to, to rejoin us, here's my next question. We're talking about phonemic awareness here, phonemic awareness, phonics, and decoding. I want you to reflect for just a moment. What do you notice about your English learners and decoding? Maybe what is something you notice? And then Dr. Kelly, I want to bridge to you here. What do we need to think about when we're talking about phonics instruction? Give us your best tips. So phonemic awareness and phonics instruction are incredibly important in terms of building students' ability to decode and to build those word recognition skills, which are essential in reading. And um, we know that reading is essentially an exercise in making meaning from text. Um, and so we want to be able uh, to always focus on meaning making with students. Um, and that's why it's helpful for them to be able to apply their knowledge of phonics to their reading and to their writing, and that we as teachers support that with coaching and prompting and support. And that there is a systematic, explicit uh, sequence, scope and sequence to the way you teach phonics to children. And so to really pay attention to, rather than focusing in on a letter a week or a letter a day, to really understand what are the principle, what are the alphabetic principles that the students need uh, to understand? What are those letter sound relationships and those connections that we need students to make? Um, and all of that strong foundation is gonna help students to be really successful, successful readers. And if we don't make those connections from decoding into the actual act of reading, Sometimes what can happen is we have students who are word callers rather than readers. So they can read a whole big long list of words that you might be able to give them and they can decode and figure out the pattern, but they don't attach any meaning to that. And you can uh, see that um, when you look at their fluency, which we'll talk about uh, in, in the next slide here. Um, and so there is this really strong relationship to students' ability to decode and to have those really strong word recognition strategies, and that those don't just exist in the very early grades. And so sometimes we have middle school students who are still focusing on decoding and word recognition and having them engage in sorts and learn morphological awareness and understand Latin and Greek roots. All of those practices um, will help unlock meaning for them so that they can have access uh, to wider uh, a wider range of vocabulary and a wider range of texts. Absolutely. And you read my mind on this one. I, I really like to point out when it comes to our English learners that a student in the middle school level um, is not beyond or above or in, not in need of direct phonics instruction. They are, you often see this when you see an English learner kind of struggling with spelling patterns over and over again. It kind of comes, a lot of times it comes down to an understanding of phonics. And Betsy, you just said something. That, that I love to think about too. And that's helping our students, particularly as they get a little older, to be language detectives and realizing that there is a system to language. And if I learn some good root words and some good prefixes and suffixes, like I can actually make an incredible amount of language. So I always say too, don't just teach a word in isolation, teach multiple forms of that word. Because what that's teaching our students is that there's a system to English, even though, even though the, the system of English can be a little bit funny. Um, that's my next point too, is that it's really important to realize that English phonics and English, our English alphabet, all of our sounds, um, there are sounds that exist in English that don't exist in other languages and vice versa. Um, and so I really want you to think about, you don't have to be, um, uh, to possess a doctorate in linguistics to, to do a quick Google search that says, what are some sounds in Spanish that don't exist in English and vice versa? What is a comparative analysis between English and Spanish? Because what you can begin then to do is realize maybe what sounds don't exist that you need to really, really teach. Um, and so all of those things um, are so important. So we wish you the very best in really thinking about phonemic awareness. And I say this, if you teach the older grades and you just were never taught this or you're not familiar, 
go down to your friends in kindergarten, first grade, second grade. They are um, incredibly smart um, at doing this. So, okay, let's move on to another question. Dr. Okello, why might a multilingual learner, an MLL, an ELL, an MLL, struggle with fluency? So now we're applying the word recognition strategies we we're just talking about into, uh, into the practice of reading. And so when we talk about fluency, we think about speed, we think about accuracy, and we think about prosody. And so it is important that students um, are able to read accurately um, and at an appropriate speed. And so that doesn't mean that students are speed reading and that they're reading everything quickly, but that they're reading at an appropriate pace um, for the particular text that they're reading. And then uh, with prosody, you're able to see um, glimpses of students' reading comprehension if they know when to slow down because um, of what a character is saying, or if they know when to speak with expression, um, when to vary their tone of voice. So if students are reading everything at the exact same sort of tone, you'll know that they're not quite understanding what they're reading. They're just sort of reading words and word calling as we, as we talked about on the last slide, rather than actually reading. Um, and so some strategies that can really help with fluency are to give students lots of practice reading and lots of time reading. And unfortunately, what we often see in classrooms is a lot of um, popcorn reading um, where students are reading maybe a sentence or a paragraph and then waiting a turn and then another student reads. And uh, those are not great practices because number one, they can really um, put students on edge and can create a lot of anxiety for students, especially English learners who may not feel that confident um, in reading aloud. It also uh, takes students focus away uh, from making meaning and they're more worried about getting a word wrong or, or saying something that they shouldn't. So um, rather than paying attention to the story, I'm counting ahead, okay, there's three people ahead of me. So I know this is gonna be my paragraph and I don't hear anything else or focus on anything else because I'm so worried about the paragraph I'm gonna read. Betsy, um, I do this as an adult when I know that I have to read something in front of my colleagues, we all, we all do this. And I think it's such a beautiful reminder that that it can be anxiety producing. And that when, when this is being done, I don't get enough practice reading. Um, one thing I think about too is, and this is just to bridge to English learners a little bit. Um, do you know, Dr. Okello, who in the classroom reads and writes the most during any given day? The teacher. The teacher. <laughs> who needs to practice reading and writing and speaking English the least? That's generally us. And so how we do what Dr. Kell is suggesting here and give our students more opportunities. Um, so I didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to just say that that deeply resonated with me. Um, so thank you for, for helping us move away from popcorn reading. I'd love to know what other suggestions you have. Yeah, so um, some of the things that we've listed on this slide are really helpful practices. So giving the students opportunity to engage in repeated reading where they read the same text. Um, and Reader's Theater is actually a really great way for them to do that because they're practicing lines. And so they're repeating um, the same thing to be able to perform it. Um, assisted reading is when you are reading alongside of a student and you can um, tell the students that this is how it's gonna go ahead of time. So you start off together and your voice gets a little bit softer and their voice gets louder as they get more confident. Um, and they can tap sort of in and out and let you know when they need a little bit of support again. Um, this is even a great strategy for parents to use when they're reading at home with their children. Um, you know, even uh, when I read at home at night, our six-year-old uh, almost never lets me read anymore, but sometimes she'll ask me to read a page and then we'll take turns. Um, so that's always a strong way to do it. Partner reading is also um, a really strong practice and students sit side by side, they can whisper read. And when you teach students how to do this really well, they really catch on to it and they know exactly what it sounds like, how they should be seated, how they should be reading together. And you can have all those really strong strategies in your classroom. Um, I just wanna ask you a really quick question and one that I get frequently. In partner reading, do I, is it best to only put my students who are at a higher reading level together? Is there any value in putting my students who are at certain levels together? Or do you see any value in mixing up those groups at any given time, those partners? Yeah, so because they're sort of mixed uh, research on, on that, I will often say to just vary the way that you group students. And so sometimes it is helpful to allow some of your stronger readers to read together. 
Um, and then uh, you also want to be able to, to vary that a little bit where you have a little bit of a stronger reader working with a student who maybe struggles a little bit more. The most important thing is you explicitly teach students what that's like so that you don't get into the situation where somebody is, is reading over someone or not giving someone a turn to read or over correcting another student. Um, so you really want to make sure you're modeling those practices uh, really well in your classroom. Um, and there, uh, I'm a big believer in choice and collaboration. And so there are times where you can ask students to choose their own partner and they will choose someone they feel really comfortable with. And you can talk to them about how to make good choices in uh, finding their reading partners. Um, and I usually have a, a, an anchor chart for pairs to go back to. I was mm -hmm. just in a classroom last week where a student wrote a song about how to partner read. And now that classroom sings that song together oh, whenever they that. prepare for partner reading. I love that. Anything else, Dr. Kello, that we should be thinking about when we are reflecting upon fluency with our multilingual learners? I think just giving students lots of time to practice. Um, and the, the fluency-oriented reading instruction um, is a great way to start that. Um, and you can use it with your basal series. So um, there's, a, there's a structure um, for that that I'm happy to share, um, where you um, have just a balance of being able to do some whole class engaged reading and then transition to some partner reading time um, and even some opportunities for echo reading where you read and students repeat. Um, and so that can be a strong um, way in if you haven't done a lot of fluency practice uh, before in your classrooms. 100%. And I, I think two things to wrap up this particular section is on the very front of your graphic organizer um, are both of our email addresses. So please email us um, for some of the resources Dr. Okello just suggested or anything that you're interested in and specifically in terms of your English learners. What this whole section here is making me realize too is back to one of your initial points is that I need to spend time really observing my English learners and seeing what is happening um, in their reading time together. Okay, whenever you're ready to rejoin us, we have a little question here on how do you in your classroom currently teach vocabulary? How do you currently teach vocabulary in your classroom? Reflect upon this for just a second and Dr. Okello is gonna give us some of her wonderful insights and how she believes that vocabulary um, is best supported. So whenever you're ready, rejoin us. Dr. Hello, we can't wait to hear what you have to say. Uh, so vocabulary instruction, um, again, we want it to be meaningful for students. We want it to be exciting for students. Um, and a great way to think about that is using a fast flood and focus approach. So uh, what I mean by fast is I might just provide students with a quick definition. If I'm doing a read aloud and there's a word in the story that I think might trip up my students, I just give them a quick synonym so that I can keep going. And that will um, help them uh, to make sure that the vocabulary is not getting in the way of their comprehension. Um, the, the flood uh, part of this instruction is to flood the classroom and make it as literacy and print rich as possible. Mm -hmm. So having a word wall, having um, lots of text for students to read and engage with. So everything that's around them in their classroom is not just for display, but is a text to be read. Um, and so really making sure that students have opportunities uh, to play with words, um, Wordle that has become really popular is a great yeah. example of a way to, to be playful about language and help students understand phonics and, and also uh, building new vocabulary and new words. Um, and then the focus approach is rather than teaching students a list of 20 words that have no connection or relationship to one another, to be able to really focus in on what are the four or five key words that I want students to develop really deep knowledge of, and then I can come uh, at that from creating concept maps, having students see how those words are connected to each other, having students um, write sentences about those words that really help them sort of access that meaning. And a lot of those words can be um, content specific. So science and social studies words are great examples of focus words um, that really help students develop a really strong academic vocabulary because there are uh, lots of words that students um, are never going to hear just in casual conversation. Um, and that's another great reason why I suggest teachers do a daily read aloud, because you're going to expose students to many, many more words than they are ever going to hear just in, in regular conversation. And then you can have students keep their own personal word dictionaries of words that they love or words that they're curious about, even as they're doing their independent reading. 
Um, and so that helps students to, to understand that vocabulary is something that we will work on forever. We're always learning new words. Always learning new words. Um, There's a great quote by a researcher and it doesn't even matter. I'll, I love this quote and just says, children love learning big words. I don't know if that's completely proven, Dr. Kello, but I think it's true. I think children and all adults, and that's something I always tell my students is, I am still learning English as an adult. I learn new words. At this point, it's probably just the slang that my middle school students are using. It doesn't matter. I'm still learning English as well. So that's such a good reminder, um, Dr. Okello. I did want to add here too, one thing that I really think is important is to remember that your English learners are not devoid of vocabulary. They probably possess a substantial vocabulary in their first language. And that if you are able to, through your own linguistic skills, point out what we would call cognate, so words that appear the same in two languages. Research tells us that English learners, by just kind of age and metacognitive abilities, don't actually recognize these the way adults do. So I kind of intuit like concert and concierto. I kind of make that bridge. Research shows us that English learners don't always inherently make that bridge, so that jump. So if you can point out these particular words, I, I it's just tremendously, you're expanding and multiplying our students' vocabularies. And Dr. Kelly, you talked about something else that I love, and that's using personal dictionaries. One skill that we need to teach our English learners is to actually how to use a dictionary well, whether it's a, a digital dictionary or literally a paper dictionary, and that we need to create classrooms where it's okay if you don't know a word and you need to quickly look it up. That's okay, and it's something that is part of language acquisition. I also love a personal dictionary for our English learners. In the younger grades, I suggest some of the ones you've seen before that are done by each letter. So A, a words, B words, because we know I do this in my second and Spanish is my second language where I like kind of know a word or maybe I've heard it, but I'm not going to really acquire it until I see it written. And sometimes I need to go back and reference it multiple times. Up the grades, I've seen personal dictionaries for English learners look like subject areas, right? So I have a tab for social studies or math or science to where students can become masters and owners of their own language. As a teacher, I don't know what Betsy doesn't know. Um, I don't know that. And that's something that, that they need to become comfortable with. So these are wonderful things to think about when we're building the vocabulary of our English learners. Dr. Kello, do you have anything else to add here about how to connect vocabulary to reading? So the only other thing that I would say is, um, and I think the cognates are a good example of this, of being able to connect known words to new words. And so if you give me something that I can attach that new knowledge to, that's going to be stickier than if I just, if I don't have anywhere to put that new knowledge, right? So the more I can connect and think about um, relationships among words and among concepts, the better uh, or the more likely it is that I'm going to actually, that those words will make it into my, into my own vocabulary and that I will have uh, continuing opportunities to learn them. So we want to get away from practices like um, you give students a list of five words at the beginning of the week, you test them on those words at the end of the week, they never hear them again. Um, because that's not, it's not likely that those words then are going to stay in their, uh, in their vocabulary. Um, so you really want to make sure um, that students have those opportunities. And then I think there's wonderful opportunities to extend vocabulary into their independent reading. So as you've pre-taught some vocabulary words and they find those actual words in the text that they're reading, there's excitement there about, oh, look, this is the word that we just talked about and it's in this story. And so uh, being able to make sure that you're drawing those connections um, and that you're pointing out to students the words that authors use when they create text and that those words are intentionally um, chosen and, uh, and help students again to think about themselves as readers and writers um, as they're engaged in those activities. I love that. That's really beautiful. Take just a moment on your graphic organizer and think about how you might enhance your vocabulary instruction through this idea of fast flood and focus or making connections between known to new words. Take just a moment. Okay, let's talk about comprehension. In what ways do you support and monitor reading comprehension in your classroom right now? And Dr. Okello, how can we possibly or potentially do this better for all of our students? 
Yeah, so we really want students to use uh, research proven strategies for monitoring their own comprehension. Um, I will often say to, to students or even to teachers and adults, how many of us have gotten to the end of a, a page and realized we were not paying any kind of attention to anything that we read? And inevitably the hands go up, right? Because we're not always deeply engaged in, in the reading that we're doing. And as adults, we know that then that means we need to go back and reread and that we need to re-anchor in what we're reading. We need to put away whatever was distracting us. Students don't automatically know to do those things. And so we have to give them the metacognitive awareness to think about what are the things that are pulling me out of the text and are, are making it difficult for me to, to, to read. So being able to make sure that students stop after they've read a certain section and summarize, what did I just read about? What are the some of the key um, things that have happened so far in the story or some of the details of this informational text that, I, that I'm reading. Um, having graphic organizers where they can write those things down as they're reading. So I always say that students should read with pen in hand and not um, wait to write until after they've read. So typically what happens in the classroom is we read a story, at the end of the story they answer comprehension questions, but they don't write anything as they're reading the story. And so that it's difficult for them to stay engaged. So having post-it notes that they can write things down on and stick them into the book as they're, as they're reading, um, being able to annotate text, being able to use a graphic or organizer to keep track of, um, of what's happening, how to make sure they're asking questions about a text. I wonder what's happening here, or I wonder what will happen next and using their skills in prediction. Um, and that students should generate questions before, during, and after reading, not just answer somebody else's questions about a text. And they can pose great questions to one another. Um, and that, that again, builds on that authentic experience of reading and writing. So many of us join book clubs and love to discuss a great book that we've just finished with other people. We don't love to answer a set of comprehension questions at the end of the book. So it's rare you're gonna find a novel that, that comes with some questions at the end for you to answer, but it is common that you're gonna to wanna to pick up the phone and call a friend after you finished a great book. Oh, you I love that. I love that. And I love your example too, of how many times do I read with my pen in hand, right? I do it all the time. Um, I love that. I love that. All of those are great ways to build comprehension. I encourage everyone at this point to pause the video for just a second and think about how you're supporting and monitoring reading comprehension. Okay. We have two more. Here's one of the last ones. In what ways do you support and monitor reading comprehension. So we talked about comprehension and Betsy already bridged to this where she talked about getting on the phone and talking to your friend um, at maybe a deeper or higher level. How do we kind of, Dr. Okello can put multiple domains together, right? So how do we connect listening, speaking, reading, and writing? Tell us more. Yeah, so we really want to make sure students have opportunities to engage in high-level talk and writing about the text that they're reading. And so literature circles, small reading groups are wonderful um, structures to put in place so students have those opportunities and to be able to anchor back into the text. So for students to say things, and I've seen this happen so powerfully in classrooms, I want to talk about the scene that happens on page 42. Everybody opens their book to that scene and a student reads something aloud and they, and they talk about a question together. Um, and we want to make sure that anytime students are engaged in, uh, in those types of reading groups um, where they're, they're talking about text, that there are are assigned roles for people to take on, like a question with someone who's responsible for the question, someone who summarizes, somebody who um, uh, monitors the time. And, and we want every student, every child to feel like they uh, can actively participate in those discussions. And we don't want anyone to be, to be silenced in that. And so even if that means for your English learners that you're going to provide additional scaffolds for them. So creating sentence stems so that they can enter the, the conversation in powerful ways. Um, and so they can have a bookmark with those sentence stems so that they um, have them to go back to as an anchor and um, pre-teaching them some things so that they feel really confident using the vocabulary that they're gonna engage with as they have the discussions or as they, as they have opportunities to write um, are all good strategies to make sure that everyone is actively participating um, in those, in those conversations because we don't want students to feel like they don't have anything to contribute or they don't have anything to add. 
So we want to make sure that there, um, all of those opportunities are equitable that, and that they're purposeful and that students learn how to build on each other's ideas. So you can teach the whole class things to say, like, I want to build on what Katie just said and teach them how to use each other's names and build on each other's ideas so that they're not just talking to show off the knowledge they already have, but they're creating together new knowledge. Um, and so they're all better off after the conversation than they would have been engaging in the text by themselves. A hundred percent. I love all of that. And I think you read my mind when it's with our English learners, how do you just provide those scaffolds? So they have a voice um, and they feel very, very valued. All of that is incredible. Thank you. How do we make a commitment to responsiveness here? So how are you selecting in your classroom texts that represent your English learners? And before I let Dr. Keller talk about this, she's going to be embarrassed, but I'm going to tell you that she has an incredible uh, a video series called We Are All Readers and Writers. You've heard her tell you that herself here, that we are all readers and writers. Um, and by emailing her or me, we can certainly give you access to her incredible videos where she walks through some really incredible um, literature pieces that involve diverse characters, diverse topics, really with this beautiful idea of representation. So check her out because it's amazing. Um, but Dr. Akello, Talk us through why you think that this idea of commitment to responsiveness is so important for all children in our classrooms. So as you can see uh, in the image of diversity in children's books in 2018, um, the vast majority of children's books still, we're getting a little bit better, but still feature white characters. And so our, our white students have many, many what we call uh, mirrors. So they have lots of reflections of themselves. There's lots of different kinds of stories. Um, and then if you do an analysis of children's books, after white characters, the next largest group of characters that you will find are animals or other trucks, airplanes, things like that, um, before you get to another um, ethnic or racial group. And so um, this has consequences because representation really does matter. And students want to see reflections of themselves in stories. Um, so I will say our, our daughter, Beatrice, um, who is six, the very first thing that she says is, oh, wow, this character looks like me. And it, it really uh, helps her to connect with the story um, when she feels like that character um, has some of the same experiences that, that she has had. And um, it's I also... Sorry, I'd add to that too, right? Our, our little one also, also multiracial here loves to our oldest all of a sudden when words have Chinese characters or she sees the word nine, or she sees some reference to something that she can see in her own family, there's just this beautiful connection um, that is made because again, our children need these mirrors um, to see themselves in. And so this graphic is just, it's really interesting to me um, about the disparity here. Um, and we'd love to know more Dr. Kello about like, continue to help us understand why this is important and maybe where we can get access to some great books for our students. Yeah, so um, I will also add that in addition to mirrors, it's really important to give children windows into the lives and experiences of others. And so um, it's not just important um, for you to have a cultural match between the students in your, in your classrooms and, and the stories that you expose them to, um, but also to think about um, how do we give them a wider exposure to uh, the beautiful diversity that exists in our world and especially in our Catholic communities as well. Um, and so uh, that's, that's additionally important. So I think thinking about both of those ideas about books as, as windows and books as mirrors, and then uh, there's some great resources just that will just sort of help you to interrogate, like what does my library look like? What kind of texts are there? Whose voice matters? What um, what perspectives are 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 included, and whose are excluded? Um, and this isn't just for picture books, and it isn't just for classroom libraries, but also to think about even in science and social studies, whose perspective do we most often hear um, in those texts? Whose stories are not told? Um, we know that background knowledge matters a lot in reading and the sense making um, that we do around text, but I will often ask who's background knowledge. Um, and so too often we have a deficit idea of all the background knowledge that students lack because we're not drawing on the funds of knowledge and the background knowledge that students do bring because we have to do a little bit more work to figure out what that is, uh, especially if we don't share the same culture as, as some of our students. Um, and so I love this, uh, this quote from Nell Duke, who talks about 
how readers who are rarely provided with opportunities to read texts that reflect their cultural backgrounds. It's not just that um, it's, not, uh, it's not as responsive and it's not as beautiful of a classroom community, it also impacts their reading comprehension. So when students are able to, uh, to access different language in the book, that is language that they know, and they can share that with their class and even teach their teacher something that the teacher didn't know, you're, we're activating that child's background knowledge and showing, centering, and valuing the knowledge that they have and that they bring. Um, and not in a superficial way, but in a very uh, significant way that signals to children that their knowledge matters, their family's knowledge matters, and that we care deeply about the home languages of their families and the rich cultures that they bring. And that's that's going to make our whole classroom community richer for us knowing about it. Um, so I, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about <laughs> I love this. Um, and really centering and valuing the knowledge that students bring and, and tapping into those deep funds of knowledge, um, which is work on us as teachers. And so I will always tell teachers that um, you are students of your students as much as you are of the curriculum that you teach. And so the more deeply we know students and their families and know uh, the assets that the students and families bring, the more powerfully we can tap into that in the classroom. And I loved what you said here. I mean, this is a perfect wrap up to say, you said our families and their homes and their communities matter um, and they matter tremendously. Um, and our English learners are a group at this point that we're really specifically focused on here, but we need to help our students um, know that they matter and to show them that they matter and that we care deeply about their literacy development. So by, the, by today, we hope that, that you were able to, to really think about these two concepts. So number one, big check, were you able to develop a deeper understanding of your English learning students? And hopefully you were able to identify the essential elements of literacy instruction to ensure high quality, equitable literacy practices for all of your learners. You have some homework in your packet. You've created a series of scenarios that we typically see in classrooms around reading. We'd love for you to re-envision those um, and to share your re-envisionment um, with your colleagues as well. We would love to hear from you. Please stay in touch. And as always, thank you for your good and important work. Bye friends. Bye, thank you.